Now the last topic of abnormal EKG is ischemia, injury, and infarction. I need to um, define these three terms, um, but before I define them, I want to emphasize that an EKG is very important. It's a very key tool for diagnosing myocardial ischemia and infarction. When a heart becomes ischemic, um, electrophysiological changes occur that can affect both rhythm and conduction. And it, the EKG is very good at identifying the extent, the location, and the progress of damage to the heart following ischemic injury. So this is a very key tool for ischemia, injury, and infarction detection. Ischemia is defined as um, insufficient blood flow to meet the metabolic demands of the tissue. Um, put it, think of it this way, the delivery of oxygen, which is coming from the blood, is not adequate enough relative to the demand of that tissue. It is a relative term. A person under resting conditions may have enough blood flow to meet the metabolic demands of the tissue. There's no problem. If these people start to exercise or become stressed or even like start shoveling the walk, ischemia may then become prevalent or evident. With um, injury, an injury is a damage or injury to the myocardium. It most likely results from and follows myocardial ischemia, but Injury can result of mechanical injury, say blunt force trauma, you know, a, a sports injury, a hockey puck getting hit. People have been have been killed from hockey pucks hitting them in the chest and causing significant myocard myocardial injury that resulted in their death. The injury can result in infectious diseases that da damages membranes, but most li most common. It's a result of ischemia from coronary artery occlusion. Infarction is where you have necrosis or death of the myocardial tissue. Ischemia and injury are both reversible. Once you have an infarction, that is an irreversible process. The muscle will be replaced with scar tissue. This can result in problems with um, maintaining adequate cardiac output because that infarcted tissue is not going to be per not participate in contraction. It's not going to be not it's not going to be contractile. It won't be as stretchy as the original muscle was and that can lead to problems. Injury can lead to problems too because an injured muscle will not be able to work effectively. The ischemia and injury, because they are reversible processes, it's very important to restore blood flow if that is the issue as quickly as possible to avoid the problem of an infarction from occurring. All three processes result in EKG changes. Often ischemia, you'll see the EKG changes associated with ischemia would be T wave abnormalities. Injury, you will, you will see ST segment changes, which is what we'll be looking at today. And infarctions, we'll be seeing what some of the EKG abnormalities that will be evident with an infarction. The first thing that I want to show you is something we call a current of injury. Now, I want to ex try to explain to you what will happen with a current of injury and I want you to think of it as uh, this way. The EKG signal is a function of the potential difference between the ends of a battery and the orientation of the battery with respect to the electrodes. Your maximum potential difference, which will give you your maximum deflection on an EKG, occurs when one end of the battery is fully depolarized and the other end is fully polarized. Now if both ends of the battery are either fully depolarized 
or fully polarized, there'll be no potential difference or no net potential difference and you'll have no deflection. This is what you see when you have in the isoelectric lines on the EKG, such as the ST segment or the TP segment. The, um, for example, during an ST segment, the ventricle is fully depolarized. So you will not have any current flowing, so you have this isoelectric line. Um, during ischemia, maintaining that myocardium in a fully polarized state will be compromised as it requires a lot of ATP to do that. You need it to man those sodium potassium pumps to maintain that resting membrane potential. Though, so if you don't have enough ATP because of some sort of lack of, of, of blood flow, portions of the myocardium, the, the resting membrane potential may not be as negative as normal. This means that there will be current flowing between different parts of the myocardium. The normal myocardium will be fully polarized, but the injured part will be partially or fully depolarized because you don't have enough ATP to maintain those pumps and maintain that resting membrane potential. So you're going to see current flowing and so you'll see deflections in the EKG at points where you shouldn't see it. So we'll show you. If you look at the one that we drew, this the, the red dot represents the J point. Now the J point is when the, Q, the it's at the very end of the QRS complex. This is the point where the ventricles are fully depolarized. At this point, there should be no current flowing. This is that isoelectric point. That J point is always isoelectric. It's always zero potential. That is your reference point. On this, per, on this um, individual, you'll notice there is no really ST segment. The J point is the ST segment. What you're looking at over here where it says ST segment shift is really the TP segment. It's the segment between the T wave and the following P wave. So what you really look at is you look at the TP segment in reference to the J point. That should be isoelectric. It should be right in line with the J point. You're allowed though, because of normal variance, up to 0.1 millimeter shift, either above or below where the J point is, or that corresponds to 0.1, or I should say, um, it's one millimeter above or below where the J point is, or that corresponds to 0.1 millivolts, either plus or minus 0.1 millivolts. If that is elevated, in this case you see an elevation, or depressed more than that 0.1 millivolts, they call it an ST segment shift or a current of injury. Now the reason that's why people get, always get confused, why don't they call it a TP segment? Sometimes we just don't know why they do it. But the reason that I believe that they call it an ST segment is that the TP segment is shifted relative to the ST segment because really the ST segment would have been right here where the J point is. Well, why we, why did this person, you really don't see much of an ST segment? Well, it depends on someone's heart rate. There may not be a lot of time that it's elapsed there. So it's okay if that ST segment really is very shortened. So the TP segment is really evident to see because you see the T, you see the P, oh, it's that point right there. So you look at the TP segment relative to the J point. If it's more than 0.1 millivolts or, my, or, it's, or one millimeter above the J point, or if it's more than minus 0.1 millivolts or one millimeter below the J point, that is called an ST segment shift. And so what's happening is you're picking up current. Some current is flowing in the point of this EKG where it shouldn't. That injured muscle is partially depolarized, and so you're having current flowing, and the EKG is p picking that up as potential difference. Above, where you see these are ex examples from your textbook, from Guyton, they have the J point being depicted. These ones are huge. 
look at the the elevation here or the depression here it is more well more than 0.1 millivolt deflection so that is constitutes an ST segment shift or current of injury so these are synonymous terms you call it a current of injury or an ST segment shift now question I know that it's going through your mind right now is is Dr. Case going to give me an EKG and then I have to figure out if that's a ST segment shift or current of injury. Well, yeah, I could, because you should know what a J point is. You should be able to look to where the TP segment is and say, is it more than one box above or below the J point? You call an ST segment shift. Most often, I'll give it to you in word format. I'll give you a case study. And I'll say, uh, I'll say the PR interval is this. The R wave is this. I would say the ST segment. Now I don't. I won't say TP segment. I'll just say ST segment is say one millimeter, or I could use it as an ST segment of 0.1 millivolt. Well, that's perfectly fine. You don't have a problem with that. That is a normal ST segment. But if I wanted to to figure out, oh, that's an ST segment shift, I could say ST segment was 0.15 millivolts or one and a half millimeters that would constitute constitute an ST segment shift so if you know that your what your leeway is you're allowed a millimeter above or below or 0.1 millivolt if it's a, more than that that is an ST segment shift or current of injury that's automatically telling you there's an injury present once you see that, then you need to be able to tell me, is the injury in the left ventricle? Could it be in the right ventricle? Or is it in the apex or septum? So you need some other information to come up with that. Well, with an injury, injuries are associated with shifts in the mean electrical axis. And in the case of injury in the right ventricle, which is illustrated as a grayish area in that right ventricle. What you'll notice with injuries in the right ventricle, there is an associated left axis deviation. So let's try to explain this to you. With the axis or the vectors, the vectors are always pointed to the area of the ventricle that takes longer to depolarize. So always keep that in mind. The vector is shifted in the part of the ventricle that takes longer to depolarize. So if you think of the right ventricle here, portion of that right ventricle is injured, it's always partially or fully depolarized. So relative to that, the left ventricle, which is perfectly healthy, perfectly normal, will take longer to depolarize. That's why the vector is shifted to the left with a right ventricular injury. So you'll notice the negative end of the vector points to where the injury is. The positive end of the vector points towards the normal myocardium. So with right ventricular injury, you would have a left axis deviation. So a mean electrical axis less than zero degrees. With injury in the left ventricle, it will ju be just the opposite. You will have a right axis deviation because the right ventricle, which is normal, will take longer to depolarize relative to the left side because the left side is injured. It will always be partially or fully depolarized. So the vector will be shifted in the direction of the area of the heart that takes longer to depolarize. Therefore, you will have a right axis deviation with left ventricular injury. So you would have a mean electrical axis, say, greater than 90 degrees. If you have an injury in the apex or septum area, you will be, if you plot the mean electrical axis, you will have a normal mean electrical axis. Here, you got the injury here, the vector is going to be running this way here. So it's still within that normal range of 0 to 90 degrees. 
So if there's an injury in the, in the apex or septum, a normal mean electrical axis will be plotted. Now one thing I forgot to mention to you, that if you notice there is an ST segment shift, otherwise known as a current of injury, if you plot a mean electrical axis, they will call it then now an axis of injury. Instead of calling it a mean electrical axis, they call it an axis of injury. So if you have the ST segment shift, you notice an ST segment shift, and you plot the mean electrical axis, if you have an axis of injury that is a right axis of injury, we would say, oh, left ventricular injury. If you have an ST segment shift and you have a left axis deviation, that would be right ventricular injury. If you have an ST segment shift and the mean electrical axis is within the normal range from 0 to 90, the injury is in the apex or septum. So the only way you can say there's an injury is you must have an ST segment shift. If you plot the mean electrical axis and it's normal and you do not have an ST segment shift, you do not have an injury. That's probably going to be a completely normal EKG. I mean, assuming everything else is perfectly fine. Okay, so to review, if you have an ST segment shift, that's where the ST segment, which really you're looking at the TP segment, relative to the J point is more than 0.1 millivolts above, it's either like greater than point, positive 0.1 millivolt or greater than minus 0.1 millivolt, that is an ST segment shift. There's an injury present. To determine the location of the injury, you can determine the mean electrical axis. If you have a left axis deviation, you will have right ventricular injury. If you have a right axis deviation, you have left ventricular injury. If you have a normal mean electrical axis, the injury is within the apex or septum. Obviously, the best way to do this, or what they do in real life, is run a 12 lead ECG and looking for where the ST segment shift is located in the chest leads is a better way of determining the location of the injury. So I want, before I show you an example, is the chest leads, remember V1 and V2, they lie over the right ventricle. V3 and V4 lie over the apex and septum. V5 and V6 over the left ventricle. You need to look to where there's C, you see an ST segment shift. Now I want you to realize in real life, you may have injury in more than one location in the heart. So you may have, say, an ST segment shift in three and V3 all the way to V6. Because just think about it. Apex septum down by the left ventricle. Yeah, that can happen. So all depends on where the injury is. But I will try to show you one where there is injury kind of isolated. So here, here is a 12 lead ECG. So what I want you to try to look at is look at the chest leads. It's kind of hard because it's red. It's just, I had to zoom in so you can kind of see it. Is to look at the chest leads and see if you can find where you see an ST segment shift. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to point out for you the J points in each of the chest leads. Here's the J point in V1. You look at this segment relative to it. Here is the J point in V2. Here's the ST or the TP segment. Here's the J point. There's where you look. Here's the J point. Here's where you look. Here's the J. Here. Here's the J. Here. This is not a real big one, but if you look very, very carefully, you're going to see predominantly, it's not a huge one, you're going to see the ST segment shift in the apex or septum. It's more evident on V4, okay? So that's where you're going to you see it most in, v, in V4. You can also see it slightly in V3, but it's very difficult, or at least even for me, to see. What also I want you to notice is remember if you have an injury in the apex or septum, 
you will plot a normal mean electrical axis. If you look at the, st the standard limb leads, 1, 2, and 3, you see overall positive voltage would probably indicate this person has a normal mean electrical axis. I will try to sh come with a another example in lecture so you can see an injury say in the left or right ventricle and then I'll show you if there's an axis uh, deviation too. Now with an infarction with an infarction you have loss of muscle or you have death of muscle and therefore loss of muscle mass. With some myocardial infarctions what may be evident is what we call a significant Q wave. Now this is what constitutes a significant Q wave which you see right here written at the bottom. If the Q wave is more um, is about a third of the QRS complex or greater or it's greater than 0.04 seconds in duration it is considered significant. Q waves should be tiny, very, I mean most of you don't even notice your Q waves. It should be tiny. So if it's more than a third the height of the QRS complex and greater than 0.04 or greater than 0.04 seconds, it constitutes as a significant Q wave. There are some myocardial infarctions that we call non-Q wave infarctions. So you don't necessarily have to have a Q wave to have an infarction but if you see a significant Q wave, that definitely tells you an infarction has occurred. Depending on what's going on, an infarction can lead to bundle branch blocks, damage to the bundle branch blocks, because you may have problems with conduction following it, problems with blood flow, scar tissue. Depending on the degree of ischemia and damage, you may have, you may still have ST segment changes after following an infarction. So there still may be other things that follow an infarction. If they still have ischemia, you still may have T wave um, abnormalities. You may see a little bit some ST segment changes that persist after the person has had an infarction. I want to show you as an example of someone that's had an infarction, and what you'll see is the significant Q wave. If you notice, that is a Q wave. That is humongous. That is an ungodly huge Q wave. That person has suffered an infarction. Okay? So the person also has suffered some problems with conduction, but we're not going to go into that. But that is a considered to be a significant Q wave. If there has been enough damage to the heart, enough of loss in muscle mass, you may also see a low voltage ECG, but not always, because some people have had heart attacks, they didn't lose enough muscle, you may not see a what constitutes a low voltage ECG. But if you see this big old Q wave, infarction has occurred. Now that cons that's the end of this material.